Thank you. So, uh, yeah, my name is Rafael de Sodego. We're both analytics engineers at Vinted. So we're going to talk a bit about our ongoing journey of moving things to the cloud. And specifically, we're going to talk about one of the uh, machine learning models. So that was kind of our first use case. So we want to, to prove the idea work. And I guess, to be honest, like I'm pretty much just taking credit for Rodrigo's work. Uh, this is kind of pretty much the things he's been working on. I wasn't even a part of Vinted when uh, this project started. But then the plan for today is that we talked a bit about the Vinted and how we organize because I think it matters for how we're thinking about the migration. We, we then talked a bit about why we're doing it and kind of some of the thoughts around, uh, you not know, like the, the migration itself. And then the last part is uh, about a specific problem that was our, uh, we call it like the foundational use case, which was moving one of, or a few of the machine learning models that we had in production to this new uh, environment. So that's the recommendation and the re-ranking, uh, yeah, uh, products. And I won't even try to explain that, uh, let that to Rodrigo. He knows it uh, definitely better than I do. So uh, I'm not sure if you all heard about Vinted. So we are a marketplace for secondhand clothing. So our mission is to send, make a secondhand the first choice. So again, like we focus on clothing. So the idea is then that you would first, when you want to buy some clothing, that you first look for something secondhand before you go to the high street and that kind of stuff. Uh, we also have other uh, verticals. Like there's some, if you go to the website, there's entertainment, pet supplies, but we really focus on clothing. So like all the stuff that we do, all the thinking is always about clothing. So there's some numbers about the, the company. So yeah. 80 plus uh, million members, so you can imagine there's a lot of data. Also internally, which I thought was an interesting time, we have a lot of people working at the company, so that you now the platform that we build has to support the work of a lot of people. Uh, we then are active in more than 20 countries, and we work at the, uh, we have, I guess, different different offices, I guess that's what that means. Uh, then, uh, so Vinted is the marketplace, so if you go to vinted.com, uh, that's what you see, you know, like the, where you can then go to, a list your clothing and somebody else can buy it from you. But we also have other, say, daughter uh, or parent daughter companies. Maybe let's say, like, we call it them business units uh, internally, but I'm not sure if that's very helpful. But Vinted Go, for example, does uh, the shipping. So in France, that uh, is relatively big, where we have our own uh, pick up and drop off uh, points. So, like these lockers that sometimes I think in others you see, like on Albert Heijn or other supermarkets, where you can then, like, uh, yeah cheaper stuff so that i guess it gives a an idea of the size of the company and the kind of problems that uh i see that we might have some problems with the colors later so there are some coloring that's not appearing so um. let's see if the I'll, I'll let you know if something gets missing <laughs> and then internally for the data team i think so these are kind of some of the numbers so the data team is also relatively big so as i said like rodrigo and i were analytics engineers so we think about like the data curation right or data Janitor in other <laughs> worst days. So trying to organize the data so other folks can use it. The data engineers are the folks building the platform, right? So think about the streaming to get the data into the clouds or all the tooling that we have around supporting the people doing the work. So tooling around DBT, for example. Then data scientists are the folks who build uh, production grade <clears throat> analytics uh, or statistics and machine learning models. So they really like their focus is building something that's going to be deployed to production. And uh, so that's the meaning of the word for us. And then decision scientists might be what, what companies would call data scientists. So decision scientists, they will work on the teams developing the product. So there's always somebody there that will help you know, with decision making or also sizing some opportunities. And these are always deployed in the, in the team. So these are kind of the main roles for us around data. And then again, so that for me, when I joined, so I admitted maybe five months now, was one of the interesting bits for me because I find this problem very interesting, right? It's a lot of people, so making all the data tooling around, working on all this, I find it super interesting. Um, okay, so then uh, the migration. So we are moving things from a, an on-premises uh, cluster. So think about Hadoop, Pala, all these kind of cool technologies uh, to GCP. And the main reasons are these three. So part of it is that there are well, a lot of cool tooling that you now we could potentially adopt. So incrementa, as we were just discussing before the talk, 
It's not something that would ever work. In the, so like there's not a lot of development for that kind of tooling that we have on prep. So we felt like we're kind of missing out on some of the advantages. So anything that people they call the modern data stack, like this is not compatible with what we're doing. <laughs> and sometimes it could also be for hiring, right? So like a lot of the, the things that we had is like Scala jobs, Spark jobs, and it's, it's a bit harder to hire than say somebody that will develop DBT jobs, right? So today DBT is huge, just writing SQL, language everybody understands. So, so that is one of the angles. Another one is scalability. Then I feel maybe this is not the best wording for it. So the, the scale is, so the, the cluster is very big, so it can process a lot of data, but it's not very flexible. So for example, if something on the, our nightly pipelines fail, and then Rodrigo wanted to test a new thing, well, sorry, new thing <laughs> on the, uh, say, uh, a variation on a machine learning model, he needs a lot of capacity. We kind of have that competition, right? So like. We need to run some back jobs. There is somebody testing something plus all the Looker users. So it's not very flexible, right? So we have that kind of fixed capacity. And on the cloud, you can pay more and you can shift your loads as, as you want. So that was a, like another, a very big angle, I think. And then the last one is around more governance, right? Like tooling around security, uh, privacy. So a bit maybe similar to the first point where like in the on-prem, we have this very kind of spoke uh, set up, but it's very hard to kind of just adopt tooling. Like the tooling that we had available was, was kind of very, very limited. Um, then, yeah, so we're not, now then on this journey, right? So we had this cluster and we're moving things in our case to, to GCP, to the Google platform, but it's not like a lift and shift. We're not getting all the stuff that we have and doing exactly the same on, uh, on the cloud. So we the company thought that was a good opportunity to try out some of this data mesh principles. So for us, I think the only one I will focus on is more about the, the ownership part, right? So, so the idea that, you know, like you split things in, in domains or like in, in topics or whatever is the word you want to use. And, and these things will become, you now people have more ownership around that. And I'll, I'll try to explain that a little bit better, what it means for us in, in practice, right? And then, yeah, because, you know, like it's a big company, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of teams. We know this is going to be kind of a, a long process. It's not going to be quick. So we start like things we want to do is like as early as possible, start me measuring and learning as early as, as possible. So we don't kind of get in a place where I feel like, wow, this wasn't the best decision, but we like we're kind of bought into it and then it's hard to change. And then where possible that yeah, we start adding value, right? So even though we're migrating and not everything's ready, but like, Let's, is there anything that the business can profit from this? But like, can we actually show some improvement even before we can say the migration is done? So these are, things, I think, three things that we, we try to keep in mind as we, as we do the, the migration. Then the tech that we have currently, I'm not sure there's anything like huge to say about this. It's a typical, you know, uh, architecture like of the modern data stack. So I think for us, I think very important flow, it's the one at the top, getting data from production. So Kafka is very important. So either data that get out of the, the database, CDC, goes through Kafka, all the production systems, they will publish events through Kafka. This data eventually makes its way in BigQuery, which is our main kind of um, powerhouse for, for doing any kind of analytics or workloads. Then uh, I, I put the, also ver Vertex AI, so that for is important for, for the machine learning models that we're going to talk about. So that data then makes it way back into, into production. And uh, I think maybe it's also interesting if you folks like on the, on the end of the, of the picture, right? So all the arrows are pointing, all that's still on production, oh, on-premises. So our production systems are not in the clouds, so they, they run on-premises. Looker and Jupyter are also services that are still running on the old cluster. So this, if change this, maybe I'm clear, maybe we we'll keep the cluster for this kind of things. And then on the bottle, DBT and Airflow, I guess everybody is kind of familiar. So DBT is a tooling for, for, for doing the data modeling, right? So like you write SQL and it has some logic on it to kind of materialize your transformations, but all you write is SQL statements, select statements, so make things relatively easy, especially compared with the old Scala jobs that we would have uh, on-prem. And Airflow is our scheduler or orchestration. Yeah, so this is something that's also being developed. I think mostly like marketing was kind of used, playing out with Arbytes, a way so I'm not talking to Google Ads and then all the kind of third parties that we, we have. Uh, but I don't think it's super relevant for what we're going to discuss today. 
then yeah, again, so that's why I wanted to, to talk a bit about the, the data mesh, but like, so there's a lot of ideas, right? Not, not of them super concrete, a lot of like thoughts and abstract things, but that I was just wanna try to make it a bit concrete with an example, what that means for us, right? So uh, you see that the three main boxes that you see uh, are, are domains. So these are things that within the company, they exist, right? They don't make their demo. It's not like we, like, oh, like this looks like a thing. Uh, but then these are like, yeah, concepts that exist within the company. So we split the marketplace in different domains. Each domain will have typically five, seven development teams. So Rodrigo works for the buyer domain, uh, trust, so buyers, uh, what it does is around like, think about the listing. So you go to the website, wanna buy something, uh, how the listings are shown, the recommendations you get, all that kind of stuff comes from, from the buyer domain. Trust is all about, well, making sure people are safe within the platform. So think about authentication, fraud prevention, and that kind of stuff. Transaction experience is all about the, well, the actual transactions, the you know, money exchanging hands, products exchanging hands. And then the way we think about it is this, like so, all of these domains, they own some data. So they, they have no backend teams that produce tables, produce events, and uh, we'll ship that to the domain. So that in practice means that each of these things have their own Google project. They are running their own DBT projects and, and they're independent, right? So, so they, they pull some data and they produce some data. So for example, on the buyers, the items, right? That we provide to the platform. So on trust, they produce users. and Transaction experience owns the actual transactions that come uh, from, from the system, but they also need this kind of curated views of items and users. So they no longer need to understand you know, the implementation details from the source as they would in the current uh, well, on-premises uh, a warehouse, but now they, they can maybe focus more on like, well, what it means to, to, the, to, the, to the company, right? But some of the products can also be those, things like the re-ranker. So in these cases are like a machine learning model that pushes data to production. And then another part that I wanted to focus a bit is like how we currently do this. So it's not really full distributed, you know, like, so the, the migration team is still mostly a centralized team. So we, we pull people that work on different uh, domains and they're kind of figuring out how we actually build this, right? So there are a lot of choices you could make around, you know, like how you organize the DBT projects, like what kind of layers you create. Uh, so all this is done within the, the context of, of, the, of the team. And then as the, the domains get migrated, they go back and they work on their own domain. And that, I guess, I mean, I'm gonna go through all the boxes. So I think uh, hopefully it's more or less clear. And then I work at the data platform team. So we, we then take off tooling, so say, we need to deploy DBT projects in production, right? So like how we then take care of development environments, test environments, production, uh, the, all the CICD flows that, that were built around that. How we do access control, why right? we don't want people then to figure it out there on their own, we want to provide one solution. So that is currently the, 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 you know, like, so this is kind of the main thinking, I think about the data ownership and like, I guess the main idea of data mesh that we get from and then the two teams. And uh, the migration team is something that is temporary. So then the idea is that in the future, the migration team is gone, and then we really have to handle distinct yeah, domains, right? And this, as you can imagine, comes with a bunch of challenges, right? So like, the company is big, and there's different projects, or even just getting an overview of data is available and where. It is currently kind of messy, and we're kind of trying to figure out how to work that out. And I think that was my last slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, I want to mention that, of course, I didn't do this alone. There are some people here, like Nora and Charlotte, that also work in this. Woo! <laughs> and we have, yeah, more people, as you saw. And what also Rafa shared here is that each one of these domains have different uh, scheduling in Airflow. The problem is that how can we know that something is available for the other domain to use? when we don't really want to have a scheduler that interacts between one thing and another, because if not, there's going to be, I don't know, one part that is going to be a bottleneck. So we came up with some solution that still is a challenge. And it's mainly organized uh, based on the layers that we have, because we have yeah, our station layer that is quite common in DBT. But then we went to a dimensional model Kimball strategy mostly to be able to have 
building blocks that other domains can use. So these dimensions cannot be built with dimensions from other domains, but they can be used, for example, here to create something else. And then you cannot have these relationships either because you don't know when this is finishing to do this and something here can be a bottleneck for that. So the problem that we try to solve here is how we uh, manage a decentralized scheduling with dependencies between domains. And this also comes because, uh, surprise, surprise, the backend is not really well modularized. So it's not that you can build a data mesh setup if your backend is not really, really uh, split in microservices and different domains. And that's something that also from the backend and the app, they are working on that and they are going to enable some things that right now we cannot do because there are some dependencies. For example, we need to know the country of the user to talk about transactions. But then where do we put that? So we are pushing everything here. It's not the optimal solution. I think it's something that we still need to figure out how to do better. But for now, I think that the, the, yeah, the solution that we found is that everyone needs to make a clear SLO of this, right? Let's say at three in the morning, these are going to be done, and then everyone can use this. And here you cannot have these relationships because then these SLOs are useless. Uh, so yeah, I think in the data mesh implementation that, that Rafa talked, this is something that uh, we didn't plan beforehand. We said, like, yeah, it's just scheduling, right? You have models, you run them, but then you start figuring out like all these dependencies that were hidden in our on-prem uh, data warehouse because we had everything scheduling, like, yeah, everything depends on everything. But then when you start trying to get these things apart, uh, you realize that you made really bad modeling decisions and that you need to fix those when you are doing new things. But I think it's a really good thing because, yeah, you are in a migration and you can use the time for doing that and you can justify that because of um, how you see the independence between the domains. And yeah, maybe something now getting into the actual uh, use case that we develop. What we implemented was this foundational use case that Rafa mentioned, that is for the recommendation and re-ranking of items. And how this looked like, if you use Vinted, maybe you saw these screens, but we have some blocks where we show recommended things for you. Someone was looking at Barbies, for example. And then uh, this is the recommendation, um, machine learning model. And what we do is we get similar items based on what you liked, what you bought, what you click, and etc. And then we have the re-ranking of items that it's when you do a search, for example, Gucci Barbie. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, it's important. Yeah, of course. Uh, in the platform, we have billions of items. And for example, we can have 30,000 items that match Gucci or that match Barbie. But then we need to order those based on your preferences to see, uh, to show what you probably will buy more. So for example, these people like shoes a lot. So we show shoes first. And this is the data that we migrated and that we tried to uh, implement on cloud. So. Here's a little bit of summary. So recommend items to members in different screens of the apps, re-ranking items and display them in the most uh, efficient order. And when we talk about efficient order and when we talk about what to recommend, we are always looking at transactions per active user. So we want to know uh, what is the best way of showing things so you buy more. Because if you buy, Vinted makes money, right? It's like foolproof. And we also have other secondary metrics because we are not only about the money, we also care about certain things like uh, that we are not hurting certain users versus others because it's really important for a marketplace that it's two ways that you protect your sellers. If you only sell things of, I don't know, 10 people, then you will have very, very low things, to, like not a lot of, of things to sell. So you want also to be fair to the people that is publishing things so you can have more offer to offer to the other people and you don't cannibalize that with the, with the people that is uh, selling things. So we also need to be fair there. And to implement this, 
we process 10 terabytes of data uh, every day because that's the data that, that the pipelines use. And basically, it's data about everything that you see in the platform, everything that you click, everything that you make a favorite. If you use Vinter, you will see there's a little card where you can make favorites. And yeah, everything that you purchase and all the attributes that those things that you bought or saw or click uh, have. And also what other people did with those same things and how those things are related to you. So we end up processing a lot of data because we have 80 million people working. And I think that we got uh, three big learnings from how to process 10 terabytes of data every day because in on-prem, it was just what Rafa said about capacity, right? Like, yeah, okay, where we just wait and some other things get blocked. But in BigQuery, you can do it, but then you need to pay. Um, so we had mostly three things that we learned from this that we were not doing in our on-premises data warehouse and that we were able to implement here to, to yeah, because of the learning. One thing is uh, incremental models in DBT, but it's impotent that every time that you run a model in Airflow, you should have the same result. And in our case, the same result is we replace the same partition of data. In BigQuery, you can partition your data by certain stuff, mostly time. But every time that we run in Airflow, we don't do uh, like this thing of get the max value of what we already have. We always replace the same partition of data and we use the Airflow variables to know what partition to replace. So if we need to backfill data or something fails or the Kafka pipeline is down, <laughs> we know that we can go back to, I don't know, three days ago, we run that and we, de we get the same uh, data. And this is also very important because we also process uh, hourly incremental and daily incremental and we need to merge them. And this merging, uh, occurs in what we call quasi-lambda architecture because uh, imagine that, yeah, you have 10 terabytes of data. If you process everything at night, you are not going to have fresh data in, in hourly intervals. And if you want to process the whole day, you will need to every hour process a lot of data. So what we do is basically we have an idempotent incremental model for hourly things and for daily things. And we have a view that union Though that unions those, those two things, and then that goes further down. And here in the hourly incremental, we only process the last two hours of data because we are doing it with an idempotent model that is incremental. And the other thing that we learn from here is that you cannot work aggregating data uh, as it comes because aggregating 10 terabytes of data, it's, it takes some time. So we started using something that maybe it's obvious that it's, uh, yeah, you aggregate by hour, like every time you're aggregating, again, in an idempotent incremental model by every hour, and you grab all the, all the hours that are by, yeah, definition are gonna be smaller than the whole raw data. But something that BigQuery has that is very neat, I think, is this HLL++ functions that allows you to aggregate distinct counts. Because if you just aggregate like number of something, it's really easy to roll it out. But then if you aggregate in distinct counts, you cannot say like in one hour, it could also happen in the other hour and you're counting twice. But these functions allows you to uh, aggregate this in a statistical way that can have some error, but it's good enough for our volume. So if you have very, very big volume of data, when dealing with this HLL++ is hyper log log. So it's hyper log log plus plus functions uh, allows you to do like rolling increments with count these things. That is something that we do if you imagine our data. Um, yeah. So we were redesigning our data warehouse with these kind of strategies. So it's not that we were making one-to-one -one copy. So of course there are gonna be differences. How did we know that we were right? Are we? We don't know yet. Maybe. Well, we started with statistical data checks, right? You have the same row counts. Of course, if the difference is 1%, you say, yeah, it's good enough. 
let's move to the to the next thing. It's really good for transform data, but it's really challenging when you get down to the pipeline and you are like starting to see more transformer things that the machine learning algorithms use. It gets really complicated because with distributions and row counts, you get like a lot of differences. Maybe there were some filters that we were not considering and etc. So it was good for the first part of the pipeline. Then something that we discover and we keep discovering is unit testing your transformation. It's something that is going to be added to DBT in 1.8. So it's not still uh, out. There are some packages for that. But I think it's something that we had really, really good in our on-prem setup. We were using Qcumber tests for Scala shops. And that, that means that you can have like some CSV with mock data. And you say, like, OK, run my pipeline with this mock data and you have unexpected. So it's the same as a unit test for, uh, yeah, for a function that you can do in code. You do it for your code. And this was really good because it's also good to communicate your expectations, right? I have this. My code is doing this. So it should be getting this result. The problem that we have here is that the unit testing capabilities of DBT are not completely fully developed. So in core, they're going to add it now. And we develop our own unit testing thing. But then, as you can imagine, you have a lot of things. For example, the hyperlog log functions. You have nesting and, and repeated records in BigQuery. So how do you make differences between those and how you can see uh, really well what are the differences between your expected and your uh, result? Well, we are discovering that the hard way. So we are keeping uh, our development there. We are going to see what DBT uh, offers now with the new version. And, and we, I, I think at least this is something that everyone should keep an eye on and try to start seeing this, because it's very cheap. You don't need to use test data or anything. And it's very clear. And also, if you change the model, you can see, hey, my, are my assumptions right also? Then. Of course, machine learning allows you to do offline validation of machine learning models. You train your model, and then you have some score metrics. And this was something quite useful, because we had the opportunity to see what were the score of the train data with on-prem, and what was the score data of the dataverse. Um, and this was yeah something quite good. If your model performs in train and test, Similarly, then you can say, like, hey, this might be working uh, properly. But the problem is that if you get a score that is different, then you don't know where the problem is. You can try, I don't know, explain it with Sharp, explain different things, but then it doesn't translate really well to what's going on in the pipeline. Uh, so you need to uh, sometimes uh, figure it out. And some things that we figure out is that we thought that in on-prem, we were doing some stuff. And we said, like, OK, let's translate that to our migration thing. But then it resulted that we were not doing that. So we ended up with unexpected feature engineering, as I call it positively. right? So they were doing some stuff that they were not expecting. And that made our models uh, slightly better. Uh, once what we, when we solved this, uh, we get to A-B testing. And this is something really nice from, from Vinted, because we have a big culture of A-B testing. We have someone from the experimentation team here, Domenicas. It's around. So he's working uh, in our experimentation platform. And it's one of the things that we uh, embrace at Vinted. And this is really nice, because we were not only testing like features. We were, only, we were also testing our pipelines. That means that from now on, if we change something in our pipeline, we will need to A-B test it, because we can. And that's something that is really cool. And what it was also really cool is that it gave us a really performance measure with statistical significance. If my pipeline performs the same or better than the previous pipeline, then it's fine. I don't need to look anything else into the data, because we are making money, right? And that's. It's about the Benjamins. Um, and also, what is nice is that some experimental metrics show us where the, di the data might be wrong. Because we had, for example, different countries. And we saw that in the countries where the currency was not euros, the things were wrong. 
So maybe we are using something wrong in our currency conversion. And it was the case. And also, for example, we saw very similar metrics in clicks and favorites. And we got the impression that something was wrong there. So we saw that we were calculating something wrong in clicks. Basically, we were using favorites to calculate clicks. I don't know, copy paste errors. And that can happen. So after six or seven iterations of A-B tests, we got it right. And we deployed it to production. And people is really happy because now with this new setup, the training data takes 90% less time. They don't need to wait for the weekends to train data. They can do it right away because we pay and we get the data. We have uh, all the capabilities of Vertex AI to develop the automatic retraining of things. And now we can easy A-B test alternatives because we don't need a lot of time to train data. So people can experiment more and try more things. So for example, we are training uh, different algorithms. We are training different uh, post um, re-ranking rules, right? We have the ML training pipeline, but then we can have some heuristic rules afterwards. So we have a lot of things that we can do. Also, we have the benefits from all the freshness and data quality out of the box from DBT test. For example, we know when we are calculating features with not fresh data, and we can expect that that can have some impact. So we can maybe using, using causal inference, we can see what's going on there, right? Let's see, I don't know, in next talk. And then by allowing this reworking and changing the way that we process our pipeline and trying these new principles, we bring more clarity and consistency to our data because imagine, I don't know, 10 years old uh, data model built year by year with new people, with changing requirements, with changing platform, with everything, starting from scratch, it's really, really good. And I think, yeah, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.